So you're welcome to Hardwick Evangelical Church um, this Sunday. Um, I just want to start, we're going to sing a few songs in a minute, but I just want to start by reading something from 2 Corinthians. Uh, it's 2 Corinthians uh, 3, and it is um, from verse 15. It said, even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lots of talk either today on the other side of the Atlantic or here about when are we going to get our freedoms, when are we going to get our freedom back, when are we going to be able to do what we want. Um, and I've just been thinking as we've been talking about this and as there's been lots of talk around, um, when are we allowed to do what we want, when are we allowed to get back to what we used to do, when are we allowed to go wherever we want. Um, just a reminder for me that the ultimate the ultimate freedom is found in Christ. We cannot find that in, in anything that anyone can give us and anything that anyone can take away. Our ultimate freedom is found in Christ. We're going to sing a few songs this morning. And the first song we're going to sing, it references that. It talks about us coming and being chainless, coming and being fearless, coming to the foot of Calvary, which is where that freedom was secured. So we're going to join in song this morning. We're going to start with Rescuer and then we're going to move on to a couple of other songs. So please join us. He's a rescuer. Hey, he's a rescuer. Hey, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Hey, oh, how grace abounds! Hey, we are free from sin forevermore. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shamed. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed, for the good Lord has come to see him today. He's our rescuer, hey. he's our rescuer, hey. we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, hey. oh, how grace abounds, hey. we will praise 
Father, we thank you that you are the faithful one. You are so unchanging. And we can always come to you, as the song says, we, we call out again and again. And it doesn't matter if it's the first time, the tenth, the hundredth, the thousandth time. You are there and you hear us and you, and you want to hear us and you want to be in relationship with us. And we thank you for that, Father. Amen. We're going to hand over now to um, Dave and Linda, who are going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Good morning, everybody. This first prayer will be in four parts, and uh, there'll be a time for you just to reflect after each section. We start off with the word adoration. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God of majesty and power, who spoke and this world was, who breathed and this world lived, who counts the hairs upon our heads, who sees our thoughts and reads our hearts, who loves us more than we deserve. How can we not bring today our sacrifice of praise? Fuse quietness now as you reflect on adoration of God. Confession. To you, O Lord, we bring our lives, troubled, broken, or at ease a sacrificial offering for you to use. 
take away our selfishness and teach us to love you as you have loved. Take away our sense of pride and show us the meaning of humility. Thanksgiving for your word which endures we give you thanks for your promises to which we hold we give you thanks for such intimacy with you we give you thanks Commitment. Singing glory, honor, wisdom, power to the Lamb upon the throne. Hallelujah. I will lift him high. Singing glory, honor, wisdom, power to the Lamb upon the throne. Hallelujah. I will sing with every breath that I am given. I will sing salvation song. And I will join the chorus of creation, giving praise to Christ alone. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring before you some of the needs of our world. We pray for the areas affected by the volcano eruption in Goma DR Congo. Lord, please help the displaced people to find shelter and a place to set up their homes. We pray for the unaccompanied children who have been separated from their parents. May they be kept safe and soon be reunited with their families. We pray for the work of UNICEF, the Congolese Red Cross, and for Erastan, amongst others who are seeking to provide help and relief. We pray for the people of Manila area in the Philippines, who have been affected or are in danger because of the toxic ga gas emission from the tail volcano. We do pray, Lord, that this volcano will stop and the people will be safe and Lord, we do pray for those people who are running and fearing for their lives. And we pray, Lord, that these things will just stop in your name. We just pray for you to do that. Also for the fear of COVID as they run and, and to get away from this, this gas, Lord. Please protect them. We pray for India and ask that the COVID virus be stopped in its tracks again, Lord, for those people who are waiting to be vaccinated or are frightened of the vaccination, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will intervene in that area. And we continue to pray for the rescue operation following the Miami apartment block. Lord, many are still missing. We do pray, Lord, that in your mercy, Lord, there will still be some people found alive. And we do pray for all of those families affected wherever they come from, Lord, please be very near and dear to them at this time. And we bring you our country and again ask that the Delta variant and all the outbreaks will stop, Lord. We do pray, Lord, that we will see your hand, your miraculous hand healing the world as you, as you stop this virus. And we will have to realize, Lord, that it was somebody greater than the vaccine, Lord, that you alone has stopped this. So, Lord, we do pray, Lord, for all the things that we have mentioned and all the things that we haven't mentioned that other people are praying for. So, Lord, we pray for the Christians around the world who are helping keep them safe, Lord, and, and strengthen them to carry on. So, Lord, we pray for all that in, our most, in your most precious name. 
Amen. Amen. Now may we join together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Dave and Linda. We're going to... Um, we're going to worship again. We're going to listen to um, or sing along with a, a pre-recorded song that we've uh, we created. The Lord is my my shepherd. I was um, when I was a, a small a small boy. I remember hearing in a I can't remember where it was. It was a Sunday school or it was a group about um, about a, a preacher who would go around and um, and it was in the in the sort of eighteen mid eighteen hundreds and he went around a community farming community in the north and. Um, and he was trying to teach people um, how how they could remember key parts of of who God was. And he went to a farming community, and he um and he taught he taught them the Lord is my shepherd. And the way that they remembered it, and it's always the way that I've remembered it. I think it's always testament to these things that they stick. Um, but it was um he had his hand, and he said the the Lord is my shepherd. So it was the five fingers on your hand. It was the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. And that was the way that he taught the farming communities and, and particularly these young, young children um, there about who God was. And he, he left, the preacher left in a year. The story goes that a year, year or so later, he came back. And, um, and when he came back, there was one of the, one of the um, teenage boys that he had been teaching this to was missing. And, and he went and spoke to the family and the family said there was a big snow drift over the winter. And unfortunately he got, caught out in this snow drift and um and they they saw it and he was he was full of sympathy for what had happened and then when he talked a bit more the the mother taught um the mother basically explained to the preacher that when they found him he was holding on to his fourth finger the lord is my shepherd and it's the my it's the the lord is my shepherd we aren't when we listen to this and when we sing this song we aren't singing it about someone else we aren't singing it about uh some ethereal idea that we can't put into our own emotions and our own feelings the lord is my shepherd so when we sing this song and when we listen to this think of your relationship with god think about how the lord is your shepherd he cares for you he protects you he looks out for you he wants the best for you he is your shepherd the lord is my shepherd we're going to sing that song now My shepherd, I'm not twined. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust. I will the trust. Truth. I will trust. my ways in righteousness, and he anoints my head with oil, and my cup it overflows with joy, I feast on his pure delights, and I will trust I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust. 
We're going to have uh, Kate Gaze come and speak to us in a, in a few minutes, but first, um, Kate Hitchens is going to um, uh, read for us this morning, and then we're going to go straight into Kate Gaze. I'm reading from Titus chapter three. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenas the lawyer and Apollos on their way, and see they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what's good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Thank you, Kate, for reading that. So we're on the final chapter of a letter that um, Paul uh, wrote to a young man called Titus. And uh, last week we looked at, at chapter two and the various relationships that were brought into light there and how to conduct ourselves 
in those relationships. And uh, if you didn't hear that sermon, I, I recommend that you you listen to it. It was uh, very thought provoking. And um, at the beginning of our chapter, Titus goes on to talk about another relationship that we find in in life, just as we have our uh, from chapter two, we have our family relationships, we have our um, work relationships, and he talks about those. Now he's talking about relationship in society in general. He starts off with that. He says, be subject to rulers and authorities, be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. And I think that's he's giving some advice for uh, for living <laughs> in society. Don't be quarrelsome. Don't be argumentative. Don't go and just pick a fight. In in our case, don't just go and pick a fight with the government for the sake of it. Uh, but generally, for society to work, we want to um, to work together. We want to cooperate for the good of our society. And as Christians, we're called to do that. Now, I think sometimes we may be called to stand up against the government. We may be called to uh, call the government to account, for example. But generally, we're called to be cooperative in our society so that our society will work our community will work together if we all went around being just divisive all the time then it doesn't work community doesn't work does it and here he's talking about um, our behavior the way that we conduct ourselves for the good of our community we're going to work our way through this chapter and then we'll, we'll I'll draw some conclusions from or some point out some things at the end as well. So having said, having gone through these different relationships that we experience in life and how to be cooperative and positive in those relationships so that we um, may be good ambassadors for Christ, but also so that those relationships are good and wholesome. He then talks about what people were before they were Christians. He said, you were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. And you know, we might look at that and think, well, you know, that, that doesn't really describe me. I was a basically good person. Um, but I think that um, when we become a Christian, we change. Things inside us change. If we read on, it says here, but when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteousness, uh, righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. And this is bit. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and, the re and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Now, um, in, in the Gospel of John in chapter three, Jesus has an encounter with a religious leader. And he tells that religious leader, you must be born again. And they have a discussion about what that might mean. And whatever you think about the phrase born again Christian, um, I know there was a time when lots of people would say, I'm a born again Christian. And some people don't like that phrase. But nonetheless, it captures something of what it means, what happens when you become a Christian. You become a new person. It's as if you were reborn, born again. Here we have it. Um, we've been washed by rebirth, the washing of rebirth. It's not that we all become uh, perfect. Uh, it's not that we all become clones of each other or clones of Jesus, but that something inside us is fundamentally different. That the ideas, the motivations, 
uh, the thoughts, uh, the desires that um, that motivated us, that were our, also were our goals before we became Christian, they change. And we are now motivated by God to do what he calls us to do. Our hearts are changed. Uh, let's say our character in someone is changed. And also our behavior changes. Now it is not necessarily overnight that suddenly we do everything right um, and that suddenly we're, we're nice people all the time. I'm not sure that nice is what we're looking for, but let's just use that one for now. <laughs> um, but it's that something fundamentally changes. I remember a story about um, a man who owned a, um, uh, a sort of, not a sex shop quite, but a, a, a brothel or a sex shop or something like that. And um, he became a Christian. He still ran his business. And then one day he came to a Christian friend of his and says, God's revealed to me that I've got to change the way I do my business. I've got to, I've got to change. And his friend thought, oh, great. He's going to shut down the, the, the shop. He's going to do that. And he said, God's told me I need to stop watering down the beer. Now, we might think, oh, you know that that's not a, that's not enough of a change but for him it was the first step on that change of how god was speaking into his heart to say there are things that you're doing that are in that case corrupt that you need to change and we might want the the step of shutting down the the sex shop and the brothel but actually the first step for him was to be honest in the the way he um he did business of uh, selling the beer. Nonetheless, there is change. There is change. I remember when I became a Christian, I can't, I, I can't, um, I can't put a finger on what changed, but I know that suddenly inside I was a different person. My whole um, outlook on life, my motivation in life, my aim in life was different. And I wasn't a terrible person beforehand and I wasn't, you know, going around doing terrible things. Um, so other people may not have noticed a change in behaviour straight away. <laughs> but, but relatively soon, people noticed that I was talking about different things and that I was wanting to talk about Jesus to them because he made such a difference in my life. Um, but change may be gradual and it may not be from completely going one way to completely. I mean, we, we are inside going, changing from one direction to another direction, from not following Jesus now to following Jesus. But how that outworks in our behaviour may be more gradual. Notice here, in if you have your Bibles, notice that in verse four and five, it's when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, appeared. He saved us. We could not be saved without Jesus. We could not be saved without Jesus' death and resurrection. We don't earn it. It doesn't save us because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. It comes from his love and we respond to that love. We respond to uh, the offer of salvation that he gives. We can't earn it. Nonetheless, when we become Christians, when we choose to follow Christ, when we accept the offer of salvation, being saved from sin and from death, uh, that Jesus offers, we are then justified by him. That means that we will not, um, when, when God comes to judge the world, we will be counted as righteous. And that's not something that we say, oh, yeah, I did this, because it isn't of us. We can't earn it. 
but we humbly accept what God has done, knowing that he is greater and only he can bring about salvation. And the result of that is that we are heirs. We are heirs of eternal life. Now, that hasn't happened for any of us here yet. It is still a hope. Uh, but we, we will be heirs of eternal life, not because of us, but because of God. And Paul goes on in this letter to say that he wants people to be careful to devote themselves to what is do, to doing what is good. Things that are these that's excellent, and profitable for everyone good and beneficial another way of uh, translating that i'm going to come back to that point uh, because he mentions it later so i'm going to come back to that in a minute to avoid mm -hmm. all these things that cause division foolish controversies genealogies arguments quarrels because they are unprofitable and they're useless it doesn't mean that we shouldn't discuss scripture. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and understand it. Does this mean this or does it mean that? We want to study and talk and discuss because we want to understand what God has written, what has been written in the Bible, God's book to us. But it's when we start to argue about let's say nuance or when we start to argue in a way that causes division that that's that's useless interesting that he says here warn a divisive person once and then twice and after that have nothing to do with them because they they are self-condemned i don't think he's talking about someone who comes and says i really don't understand this i think this bit of scripture or i think this way of following christ means this and we have a discussion about it he's talking about someone who's constantly coming in and uh, causing division it, it's interesting that he's called it doesn't say um someone who causes division it says a divisive person that's in their nature that they are there to cause division. And, and Paul's very clear, well, you warn them once, twice, and then you have nothing more to do with them. Don't join in the arguments. Don't, um, yeah, don't spend time talking about all of that. They are self-condemned. I think that's really, really important that we know that it's not that that um, God doles out a punishment because he feels like it. It's that sometimes what we do is important. The way we conduct ourselves is important uh, when we become Christians. I'll come back to that, as I said. Then Paul gives some um, practical things about his situation, asking uh, Titus to, to, um, to, to do certain things for him. And then he says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs or real needs and not live unproductive lives. We can't earn mm. salvation. It's not by doing good works that we become Christians. That's not, that's not how it works. It's through God's mercy. So good works or doing good is not a way to gain salvation or to earn salvation, but it is a demonstration of our faith. That our behaviour changes when we become Christians, that our motivation changes, that we are hopefully more and more filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with God's love for other people and for this world. 
And so the way that we live demonstrates our relationship with Christ. It's interesting, we, we've been reading through um, uh, the first and second letter of Timothy, and then this uh, letter of Titus to Titus. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he, um, Paul, it's the same writer, says about overseers that they shouldn't be given to drunkenness, they shouldn't be violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In that, in that letter, he's giving some um, characteristics that you would expect in an overseer, somebody who's uh, a leader in the church. Here, he's giving some of those same instructions to every Christian that we should be gentle, that we should be peaceable, considerate, not slandering people, that we should be not quarrelsome. Mm. It's not that, oh, the church leaders should be like this, but I can do whatever I want. It's that we should all be allowing the Holy Spirit to change us. And sometimes that might mean doing things that are um, or going out of our way to do good. Sometimes that means uh, self-sacrifice for the good of others. But that's what we're called to do. We're called to allow God to change us, allow our character to change. We won't all be the same. We won't be, as I said, we won't be clones of each other. We all have our own characters, but God can refine our characters. And um, so that we become the people that we're called to be in Christ. Let's do that. Let's devote ourselves to doing good. Because belief can't be separated from action. We, we do that a lot. We talk about talking the talk and walking the walk as if they're different. We, we have a saying, you know, um, somebody doesn't practice what they preach. We can separate those things in our minds. Um, what I believe is different perhaps from how I behave. What I say is different from what I behave. But in another letter in the New Testament, in, in a letter written by James, he, he has some very interesting things to say about this. He says, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. That's quite strong words, isn't it? Faith by itself, it's, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. And someone will say, well, you've got, you have faith and I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. So what we do is a reflection of what we believe. What we do is a reflection of where we are in faith. Let's be people who devote ourselves to doing good because that is what we're called to do in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, that was great. Um, there is an opportunity um, to, to chat with Kate at the end of the service. If, um, um, we meet on Zoom, and so um, at the end of the service, we meet and we discuss what, um, what the speaker talks about. And if you're joining us on Facebook and you'd like to, to join in to have a bit more of a chat about that, then you can find the Zoom links on our website, um, www.hechurch.co.uk, and you can join us at the end of the service. You can join us now if you want to. Um, and we can then chat with, with Kate at the end of the service. Um, we're going to draw our service to a close in a few minutes, but we're going to we again join in, join in song with another one of the uh, pre-recorded songs that um, that our church have recorded over the last last year or so. This one is um, is called "Living Hope," and so we're gonna 
sing that song together now. Jesus. 
Just while we're reading, while we're listening, singing along with that song, I was just reading back over Titus 3 and just reminding that bit that Kate brought to us there. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And the song just reminds us that it is in Jesus that we have our eternal hope. So thank you again for that, Kate. We're going to finish with our, with a grace in a minute, but is there any um, are there any uh, notices that anyone would like to bring this morning? anyone great well then enid um could you please um we're going to share the share the grace together and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all evermore amen So thank you to everyone who has joined us on Facebook. And again, if you'd like to join us, please visit our website um, and you'll find the links for Zoom. You'll find the information about what's going on in the church uh, this week. But we'll say goodbye to you guys now. Um, and are there any in 